In 2020, the Kansas City Chiefs won the AFC Championship and eventually captured their first Super Bowl championship in literally 50 years. On the platform of that AFC championship with confetti flying and celebration happening at a fever pitch, sports announcer Jim Nance turned and gave the microphone to Chiefs tight end Travis Kelsey. And he asked Kelsey what this moment in his life meant for him and for the Chiefs organization. If you grew up here, as many of us did, we understand heartbreak as a Kansas City Chiefs fan before 2020. We understand a long drought. Those of us growing up here, all we have to hear is Lynn Elliott, and we have nightmares. And all that washed away on the field that day. And so Nance, with this context, gave the microphone to Travis Kelsey. He probably regretted it a few seconds later. And he asked, what does this moment mean for you and for the Chiefs organization? Kelsey, ever the mercurial fellow, who one moment is a gridiron warrior armed with sweat and muscle, turned sentimental poet on that moment. And he quoted a lyric, not from legendary orators such as Homer and Tennyson, Caesar or Churchill, but from the 1980 rap group, The Beastie Boys. <laughs> and he screamed in the mic to 80,000 rabid fans, for the last seven years, you got to fight for your right to party. <laughs> and that actually becomes a calling card for Kelsey ever since. He trademarked it. After four long centuries and a lot of heartache in those centuries, Israel is finally released from the slavery of the Egyptians on the banks of the Red Sea. It is a time for celebration. This victory that they'll achieve by God has been told and retold at least three dozen times in the Old Testament alone. It is something very dramatic if you're an Israelite and very important redemptively for our church and any true church today. Soon Israel would celebrate. Soon they would raise the trophies of victory over their heads as they would see dead bodies of Egyptians floating on the banks of the Red Sea. Soon they would actually sing an immortal song that would be sung through the ages of their emancipation from slavery. But here in this chapter is the story of how they got there. To use the timeless words of poet Kelsey, they had to fight for their right to party. Party they did because God did the fighting for them. And that is what we see in this story as the central theme. Now there is enough material in Exodus 14 to take up a slew of Sundays. Uh, if you did your own study of Exodus 14, you're going to find that commentators and scholars have literally parsed every phrase of every verse of Exodus 14 to give explanations and defenses of those explanations of what they mean. That will not be our purpose today, nor the next few weeks. Our purpose is to see what the overarching theme of this story really is. And it can be framed around one verb, one action line, that appears in chapter 14 twice at very critical moments. 
It is the verb fight. And when it shows up, it is always used of God. Isn't that a curiosity? God, we typically do not think as a fighter, a pugilist, a brawler. We think of God as love, God is good, God is kind, all of that would be appropriate, but God the fighter? But that is the dominant trait we have here. And if he did not fight, Israel would still be in slavery. Another term that is deeply connected to this fight is also used twice. It is the term salvation, also used at strategic moments. So what we find here in this entire story, this entire chapter, is God fights for the salvation of his people. And he still does. Now, over the next three Sundays, I'd like to linger in chapter 14. And I would, in this journey, ask a few questions of the text. First, what does God fight for? What does God fight against? How does God fight? And most importantly, why does he? And why that should matter for us in 2023 here sitting at Calvary Baptist. Why is it important to know that God fights for your salvation? Now today, we just want to look at our first of three questions. Who does God fight against? I don't think... Uh, it was not planned, at least, to sing two songs that were militant songs. If you actually uh, remember singing them and their words, O oh God, our help in ages pass and victory in Jesus, are militant hymns from the military with this sort of fighting march anthem. Like a brilliant general, Yahweh fights against the Egyptians Israel's enemy, and therefore his, on three grounds using two weapons. Two weapons that are at God's disposal, two weapons that only God has. As we find in this story, God does not destroy the greatest superpower of the world and all the while emancipating two million of his people. In one fell swoop, he doesn't do it by archers and swords, shields and catapults, tanks and chariots. He does it with two weapons that only he has at his disposal. First, the weapon of the human heart that only he can control. And second, the power of natural creation. You and I cannot make it rain, yet we got it last night free of charge from the Almighty. So in this story, we see just how powerful our God is, that he'll obliterate, leaving no one left, the Egyptian army, by not firing one shot of an arrow, but by defeating them by their own hearts and by creation. First, he fights on three fronts. So think battle now. I don't know if we have, I know we have a few risk players in this room. May you live long and prosper if you play risk, right? Settlers of the Catan, if anyone's in. So think that, right? Think, okay, lay of the land, battlefield now. There are three fronts in this story God fights on using two weapons. The first front is that he hardens the hearts of his enemies. You heard that right. He hardens the hearts of his enemies so that they do his will in their hardened state. There is a best-selling book when I played basketball, and yes, once upon a time I did. The older I get, the better I used to be. And my head coach, Steve Sherbinsky, who knew how to breed champions, made every year us read our, our playbook. We had to memorize that. The Holy Bible, we had to read large sections and memorize the Holy Bible. 
and Sung Soo's The Art of War. We had to read that. It's a great book, by the way, that has been used by military campaigns ever since. In The Art of War, there is a chapter. To be victorious in battle, you must know your enemy. In fact, Sung Su would say, if you know your enemy, you're halfway to victory, understanding your enemy. And if there is someone that knows human beings right and left, knows their proclivities, knows their inclinations, knows their nature better than they know their nature, it's the creator of humans, God. And in this section we see what a master fighter he is. So, how can you explain, for example, that this Egyptian army, classically trained in battle, would go headlong after the Israelites in the desert immediately after they experienced the most ten brutal plagues the world has ever seen. They themselves actually try to get convince Pharaoh to release the Israelites. They know it's the hand of God that is responsible for this plague, and yet they follow the Israelites into the desert anyway. How can you explain grown men were never told that get a war council that ask each other their battle plan that just go charging headlong into an open sea? How often do seas open up? And they go charging after the Israelites unarmed into this open sea, not asking any questions until it's too late. How can you explain this madness? There is only one explanation, as the text says. It's because men's hearts are hard. And when men's hearts are hard, they will make decisions. They will say things. They will do things that under normal situations, rational human beings do not commit such blunders. The Egyptians do it. And brothers and sisters, we're living in it. How can you explain, for example, the hatred that we see on display in Israel? The, the absolute hatred for human life to decapitate babies and litter them with bullet holes. How can you explain that if it weren't for the hardness of humanity? How can you explain that every day we do similar acts in our country when we rip babies from wombs of mothers? How can you explain this reasonably if it not for the hardness of human hearts? How can you explain trying to even get an intellectual conversation with an unbeliever today and they're so unhinged they wake up mad that reason has been thrown out the door. They're blinded by hatred. It is the answer is as it's always been because human hearts are hard. And when you get human hearts that are hard, rationale and reason go flying out the window. But if I haven't been a pest yet, we have who is behind all this in verse 17. This is all by design. This is actually a weapon. This is a tactic that God uses to overcome his enemies with. He says this, as for me, I am going to harden the hearts of the Egyptians. Okay, we've already been there with Pharaoh. This is actually repeated 12 different times in Exodus. I'll let you figure this out for lunch. Okay, I won't pick a fight on that. Only the, this, the fact is, is that God uses men's hard hearts to actually defeat hard-hearted men. So he says this, I'm going to harden the hearts of the Egyptians. Now in your text, there should be a that or a so that that follows that line. That's a good translation if you have it, because it tells us reason. What is the reason that God is going to harden the hearts of the Egyptians? 
Because that, or so that, they will come after them, the them or the Israelites. So the first reason I'm going to hard, uh, cause them to be hard-hearted is throw reason to the wind so they do something crazy. They go running out after the Israelites in an open sea. But then he doesn't stop there. I'm going to let them do that so that I may be honored because of Pharaoh and his army and the chariots and the horsemen. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I've gained my honor because of Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. What is he talking about specifically? He's talking about, I will get the honor and I will get the glory when I defeat them. So I'm going to harden their heart. They're going to do something completely irrational that grown men wouldn't do ordinarily, go through an open sea. And I'm going to do that so when I'm done with them, the entire world will be talking about me. Which they still do today. If you bring up on Jeopardy, for example, or on a trivia, uh, the Pharaoh of Egypt, what is his claim to fame? His claim to fame is not building buildings and making a name. His claim to fame is he was defeated at the Red Sea. And we're going to see in three weeks how this becomes international mission and fame for the glory of God. That his name would be known in all the world as he crushes an army at the Red Sea. Never have we seen the hardness of human hearts more fully on display than at the cross of Jesus Christ. Were there ordinarily religious people who have read a Bible, who have prayed for the coming of the Messiah, who have fasted for it, who believe they're partakers in that kingdom when the Messiah comes, will completely reject the Messiah and lie about the Messiah and slander the Messiah and kill him on a slave's tree, a cross. And when they do, they are held responsible. But we also read in the book of Acts, particularly, that the cross was not some freak accident where men got carried away with themselves and God doesn't know what he's doing. No, 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 no. The cross was a foreordained plan from Almighty God. So God even uses the cross with its ugliness, with its darkness, with its sinfulness, with its death, and turns it on its head to defeat all that. And as Paul says in Romans 9, God will show mercy on whom he wants, and he will show harden whom he wants. So he hardens the hearts of his enemies. The second front he battles is also related to hearts and that he hides his enemies' eyes. He blinds their eyes. So in verse 19, we have this picture that Israel is on the banks of the Red Sea. Their backs are against the Red Sea and night begins to come in. And God's presence is seen in this pillar of cloud and this pillar of fire. And as night sets in, the pillar of cloud moves from going ahead of Israel, guiding them, to coming behind them. And between Israel's, uh, as a nation, and the army of the Egyptians. So it blocks the Egyptians. How does it do it? We're told, beginning in verse 19, that the pillar of cloud blackens the night sky for the Egyptians. So they can't see anything. It's very similar to the plague. While this pitch blackness is happening to Egypt at night, on the other side, God lights up the night sky. An ill east wind comes in, blowing the waters, drying out the ground at the Red Sea, and all night long, nearly two million Israelites walk across dry ground, fully illuminated by the presence of God. So to one people, he is light, he is shining, 
It is a clear way to the others, his enemies. They are completely and utterly blind as to what is going on. A blind lion, though still a lion, doesn't know where to strike. And Egypt has been rendered blind by God. The Egyptians cannot see what is happening to the Red Sea. They cannot see the Israelites on the move across it. They can't see any activity. They are completely and utterly in the dark. And brothers and sisters, this is still a parable for us today. Why is it that you and I can pick up a Bible, read it, and it is the very words of God, but an unbeliever can pick up the same Bible and it's utterly confusing and gibberish? Why is it that a believer can look at the gospel, as Paul said, as the aroma of life, but an unbeliever can look at the gospel as foolish and aroma of death. A believer can look at the claims of Jesus Christ as our only way to salvation, to get to God. An unbeliever looks at the claims of Christ as pure moronas, a moron, stupid, utterly foolish. It's because their, blind, their eyes have been darkened, lest the glorious gospel shine upon them. But there's also a great comforting lesson for us, God's people today, that often go through situations in this life where we feel as if the opposing forces of evil are against us in overwhelming ways. You don't have to live in this world very long to feel that. This is a parable for you, dear child of God, to take comfort. That sometimes God's presence goes before you to lead and guide you. And sometimes his presence goes behind you to block you from your enemies and protect you from your enemies and to guard you against your foes. What does Paul say? No weapon formed against you will prosper and every tongue that rises up against you will be condemned. And then finally, the third level of attack and our second weapon is he hardens the hearts of his enemies, he hides the eyes of his enemies, and he havocs the plans of his enemies. This is our second weapon now. The first is the human heart, the eyes, the heart. Now the second weapon is creation. That is specifically the Red Sea. So the next morning, the Egyptians wake up. They are fully illuminated now what's going on, and they give chase right into the middle of the Red Sea. And I think what we have is we have a replay of the plague of the locusts in chapter 10, or I should say more appropriately, that the plague of the locusts, one of the 10 plagues, is actually a prediction of the Red Sea experience. If you go back to chapter 10 to do your own study, you'll find there's amazing of the exact same words used in both stories. For example, we are told in chapter 10 that Moses is to lift up his hand and give command to the locusts to be removed. Here, we're told that Moses is to stretch out his hand and give command to the Red Sea. In chapter 10 of the locusts, we're told that God comes with an east wind to remove the plague from Egypt. Here, we're told that God brings an east wind to part the waters of the Red Sea. In chapter 10, with the plague of the locusts, the locusts are banished by God into the Red Sea and are completely consumed. Not one locust remains. Here, the Egyptians are thrust into the Red Sea, completely consumed, and we're told not one Egyptian survives. This is all payback. Now, I want you to see this amazing picture of how God uses creation to triumph over his enemies. Like many of you, I am a student of history. I love history. I teach it. 
and I love especially American history. Um, one of my favorite periods is the American Revolution. And one of the, um, other than just God and his providence to our country, one of the acts of brilliant, skilled commanders in Washington and in Gage and in Green, the American uh, triumphant, not that they were better than the British generals, they understood something about their enemy. They knew that no British general respected the American militiamen. They thought they would cut and run at the first shot, and a lot of that was true. So the longer the war went on, American generals used the American militiamen as bait to bring in the British army because they knew they didn't respect the American militiamen. They would fire the first shot and give chase to the American militiamen and would be baited into a corner of a siege so that on two sides of uh, rocks and forest, they would be met by colonist marksmen. And it was basically shoot and run, shoot and run and survive the war. This is taught in all sorts of military campaigns. One of the cardinal rules of warfare is never get yourself into a situation you can't get out of. Hence, like, don't bump up against the Red Sea because you can't get out of that. Um, that was a big blunder on purpose. But another cardinal rule used in all military manuals is never ever on a field of battle be outflanked. If you're outflanked by your enemy, you're done because it's just a numbers game. Perhaps the most famous outflanked maneuver in American history is the Battle of Gettysburg where in that four-day campaign, Americans lost more lives than at any other battle in American history. Nearly 20,000 men died. Twelve of those 20 were Southerners. And in that four-day campaign, historians and scholars have debated a lot about it. They have debated, first of all, the brilliance the brilliance that did not see brilliance on that day by Confederate commanding general Robert E. Lee, who was a genius as a defensive commander. He knows Virginia. He knows every creek, rock, hill, valley in Virginia, and his Virginia campaigns are the stuff of masterpiece. But Lee does something he ordinarily didn't do, and it cost him. He left Virginia, and he went into Pennsylvania to fight the Union Army, an area he knew nothing about, and he became blind. And Gettysburg is one of these questions that, if you study it, that Jesus Christ and Robert E. Lee only know the answer of what was Lee thinking by doing what he did with General George Pickett, the famous Pickett's Charge. Because on the bloodiest day of battle, Robert E. Lee, much to the protest of Pickett, much to the protest of Longstreet and others, he sends George Pickett as entire brigade across an open field that is a minimum of 1,000 yards long charging with no shelter, shoulder to shoulder in a march, with Union firing squads on the left and on the right and in the front, and they're marching a mile and a mile and a half in an open field with snipers all around them. Pickett loses his entire brigade. He never forgives Lee when he dies. He hates Robert E. Lee to the day he dies. Because there's the word for what Pickett did. It's called suicide. He knows it, but he has to obey the order. So the, 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 the historical question is, what was Lee thinking? It was over before it got started. What we have in Exodus 14 is the classic outmaneuvering campaign by God to outflank his enemies. But they don't know it until it's too late. They see the bait. 
the Israelites, unarmed, not one sword, not one shield, not one arrow, no one is weaponized. Two million slaves on the run is all they see. And they see these two million people go walking on dry land in the middle of a sea. And there's no questions raised about this from the Egyptians. This doesn't happen all the time. When was the last time you saw the waters parted and people walking? And without any discussion of their war council, they send their army. Josephus records who all went in. Over 600 Egyptian chariots, which was considered the greatest piece of technology the world has ever seen at that point. 50,000 riders, that's chariot and people in cavalry. And 200,000 infantry, that's three arrowhead stadiums fully loaded. They go in, charging after the Israelites. Unbeknownst to them, God, the ultimate general, has just outflanked them. We are told quite precisely, on the right is a wall of water, on the left is a wall of water, and they are going to be sealed in without a way of escape. Three arrowheads go into the Red Sea. Not one person gets out. Such is the power of God. How can it be explained other than that, that a sea would part? How can it be explained that Israelites would walk on dry land in that night, and yet somehow or some way the Egyptians, when they get in, walk on marshy land that gums up their chariots? How is that to be made sense of? How is it that every Israelite walks on dry ground on the other side and survives and not one Egyptian escapes? How is it that the classic Egyptian army, we're told here in the text, somehow or some way gets confused and then at the last moment, as God always does with unbelievers on the day of judgment, then begins to give them spiritual sight? where they know there is no hope. And now these blind Egyptians, hardened Egyptians, their last words are ironically open and honest. Here's what they say. Let's get out of here. Let's flee from Israel, for the Lord fights for them against us all. This is the power of God against his enemies, you see. The poetic description of this day is later written by David in Psalm 77. Here's how he describes the scene. The waters on that day saw you, O God. The waters saw you and writhed. The very depths were convulsed. The clouds poured down on the water. The skies resounded with thunder. Your arrows flashed back and forth of the sky. Your thunder was heard in the whirlwind. Your lightning lit up the entire world. The earth trembled and quaked. Your path led your people through the sea, your way through the mighty waters. Though your footprints were not seen, you led them. And brothers and sisters, our God still does that today. We fight real spiritual enemies. The Apostle Paul tells us that the weapons of our warfare today are not carnal, but they're mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds, casting down every thought against the knowledge of God and anything against the obedience of Christ. We're told in Hebrews that Jesus Christ actually uses the enemy's weapons to turn back on them and defeat them. He does this at the cross. This is what Hebrews tells us. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, Jesus likewise shared in their flesh and blood, so that through death, he could destroy the one who has the power of death, 
That is the devil. Do you see what the author of Hebrews is doing? Like in Exodus 14, God is using the enemy's weapons against them to render them powerless. Jesus died, not this freak accident that God knew nothing about. He did it on purpose. He baited our enemy. He died. He lives. He takes the sting of death. He takes sin so we can be righteous. He goes down so you can get up. He humbles himself so you can be exalted. He became flesh and blood so you can be called sons and daughters of God. This is all according to plan. He uses the enemy's weapons to defeat them. So now you and I can stare at death and laugh at it because it has been defeated. We can overcome sin because it has been defeated. The devil is, as Luther said, God's devil. That is to say, he does God's bidding. He's on the leash. He's on life support. And only God knows when he's going to pull the plug. And this is important for us as we leave here and we go about our lives because often we will talk about our daily battles. And I understand what you mean when you say that I talk that way. But in reality, Jesus wants us to know that he has fought our battles already and won. It is finished. It is not coincidental that at the end of all time, when Jesus finally judges sin and death and the devil, according to Revelation 18, it is, should not be lost upon us that he takes the city of Satan. What does he do? Do you remember? He takes the city of Satan and he casts it into the sea and consumes it. There is that picture. As we leave today, I'd like you to turn over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and to give one bit of application for us today that we as a church should take comfort regarding our enemies. Not to take comfort in that somehow or another through our willpower we're going to defeat our sin. Not through some moral code, but because Jesus fights for his church. Second Thessalonians chapter 1. Now, just to remind you, the Thessalonian church are suffering. They're a young church in the faith. In fact, in all probability, at least when Paul writes 1 Thessalonians, he has not met them. He just hears about their reputation for faithfulness. Uh, this young church, only a few years in Jesus, are still staying together under midst of tremendous suffering from evil. Probably the Roman government and along the way other people that are persecuting the church. So... From the get-go, what does Paul do to comfort saints that are suffering in this world by the enemies of the cross? How should we, in 2023, take comfort to a world that, let's just be really honest, is hostile to the gospel of Jesus Christ? I mean, go talk to your unbelieving friends and say, Jesus is the only way to God and see what kind of reaction you'll get. So what is our great comfort the greatest comfort given here by Paul and to us is that Jesus is coming back and he will fight. He is not coming back as some blue-eyed, emaciated sissy. He is coming back to make his enemies his footstool. And he's doing it for his people. And that, you need to understand that as we read this doxology. Beginning in verse 5. This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom for which you're suffering. Now, a couple of commentary thoughts. The suffering that you're suffering, whatever it is, if you're suffering for the faith right now, it is not an accident. I know it, it, it hurts. You want to get out of it. 
the, whatever you're suffering for in the faith right now is intended, Paul says here, to show your worthiness of being a child of God. Okay? That's, so it's a test, right? Verse 6, Since indeed God considers it right to repay with affliction those who afflict you. Right? My boyfriend's back and you're going to be in trouble. Remember that song? That's, okay, God's back. And those that have hurt you and afflicted you as a Christian, it's payday. God's coming. And to grant relief to you who are afflicted, as well as to us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven, ooh, Here's fighting language with his mighty angels and flaming fire inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction. So think Red Sea, except spiritually and eternally. Away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. And now Paul begins to slightly switch and say what your attitude should be. When he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among the... That's the return. Okay, so Jesus Christ coming back is not the boogeyman. So throw away all your revelation studies that scare you and all your decoding nonsense, right? Dating. Jesus Christ is coming back so you can marvel at him. And he can be glorified in you. Because our testimony to you was believed. To this end, we always pray for you. So here now is, let's shift to prayer requests. So Paul says, I, I'm, I'm praying for you. And I'm going, to tell you, I'm going to tell you that not only do I pray for you, I'm going to tell you what I pray for. That our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and for every work of faith by his power. That means get to work. Quit your belly aching. Don't lick your wounds. Jesus is going to come back to fight your battles. Just get to work. So that the name of our Lord may be glorified. Ooh, which is the exact thing of the Red Sea. Egyptians will be decimated. God's people will be saved for the glory of God in the world, which is exactly what Paul is praying for. Your enemies will be taken care of. You will be saved and God will be glorified. And you in him, according to the grace of our God and our Lord Jesus Christ. What is Luther's line in a mighty fortress? Did we in our own strength confide? Our striving would be losing if we did. We're not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. Does ask who that may be? Christ Jesus, it is he, Lord Sabbath, his name. From age to age the same. Do you remember the final line? And he must win the battle. He must win the battle. Father, I thank you for your dear saints, for their patience with me, and for their love of you. God, as you take this word now, Holy Spirit, tenderize our hearts, help us to live in it at work, at school, in our neighborhoods, the decisions we make, the reactions we give to know that though we live in a hostile world to the gospel, you have fought, you have won, you've achieved victory over our enemies, and you still fight for the people you love. That is our only hope. That is where we long to be, Lord Jesus, in your presence. For your name's sake we pray. Amen.